Wow, everybody, the Ethereum merge is coming up next month. Woo woo! I know we're all very, very excited to see what happens. Uh, I know I'm super stoked myself, but we're all kind of curious, you know, what's going to happen to the Ethereum miners? What, are they gonna fork the chain? And what's gonna happen to Ethereum? What are the future steps for the scalability for the Ethereum blockchain? Well, in today's video, we're gonna cover all these topics and more. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and hit that notifications bell below. And let's go ahead and jump right in and hear what Vitalik has to say about the upcoming Ethereum merge. Well, probably the biggest news this year, right, is uh, the merge is coming. So Ethereum switched to proof of stake. This effort that we have been working on for basically the last eight, um, eight years, right? So the first uh, blog post that we wrote about proof of stake was uh, in back in January 2014. And in the years since then, a lot of research has happened. In uh, 2017 to 2018, we converged on uh, what we call the beacon chain today, the version of proof of stake that we ended up actually implementing. Um, one and a half years ago, the Beacon Chain was actually launched. And so pretty soon, uh, what's going to happen is this uh, complete switch where Ethereum finally switches over to being a pure proof of stake system. And basically what happens there is um, the applications, the smart contracts, balances, everything that hap is happening inside of Ethereum is going to be automatically moved off of the proof of work chain, which will basically just like stop being uh, f uh, functional at that point and uh, move over to the proof of stake chain, right? So after the merge, Ethereum will finally become a proof of stake system. Yay. Yay. Obviously, Vitalik is super, super stoked about the Ethereum merge. He's been working really hard for eight, eight years while well, him and the, uh, the rest of the Ethereum development team. And it's just super, super stoked. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Are you guys excited for the merge? Do you guys think it's the end of an era? Let me know in the comments below. So yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at the Ethereum timeline and see what's coming. So you can see here on October 14th, 2020, the deposit contract was deployed for the Beacon Chain. And up here in December 1st, 2020, that's when you were able to go ahead and deposit your Ethereum into the Beacon Chain to go ahead and start earning those proof of stake rewards. And it looks like now, while well, jumping all the way up to 2020, September September 15th, it looks like that is the date for the Ethereum merge. So you guys can see here on the uh, GitfinitySports.com, you can see the uh, had the announcement that the merge date is happening on September 5th or September 16th. Now remember that this is a blockchain, so if the blocks end up being very slow, it could push the date even further out. So that's why there's two dates here. But we do have a date that was given by Tim Beko, which is a, an Ethereum developer. And he says that it is block number, I think, 5 trillion 875. It looks like that is the date for the Ethereum merge, and that's happening then. So let's go and take a look and see what the miners are planning to do. You can see that the miners, obviously, they purchased a lot of expensive equipment to go ahead and mine Ethereum, but they're a bit pissed off that, you know, they have, they have fork coming up and Ethereum will be moving to proof of work, which means that pretty much their equipment is being made obsolete. They're threatening to keep the initial proof of work Ethereum network running to safeguard their investment. And to resist the update, they might break off and build their POW versions of Ethereum. There is lots of talks that are being various proof of work forks after the Ethereum merge. And you can see that one of the Chinese, one of the bigger Chinese cryptocurrency miners, he said that it is expected that after the merge of Ethereum, there will be six to seven forked POWs and the exchanges will choose their token with the largest consensus to list. Miners should not criticize the Ethereum Foundation. They decided to switch to POS before. The ETH1 will still have value and try to work together to reach a minimally damaging situation. Suppression didn't work for ETC, so we all know ETC was the original fork of Ethereum. That was back in, uh, after the Mount Gox hack, I believe. So yeah, it th went okay, but you, can, you know that Ethereum Classic it pretty much reduced in price a lot. I've seen articles about Ethereum uh, sort of miners saying that Ethereum Classic can't handle all the new miners jumping onto Ethereum and Classic at once. But the truth is that if all the miners jump there, the mining profitability of Ethereum Classic will go down exponentially. However, it will become extremely secure because it'll become more decentralized with more miners. It looks like there's a chance that there's gonna be forks, but there's no real like solid plan for these Ethereum forks. Personally, I'm a bit worried about the high, the really expensive NFTs on Ethereum being forked as well as some of these stable coins. I think a lot of these stable coins, they're gonna lose their viability on the old chain because they're, you can't just double your US dollar amount, right? So all of this USDT, USDC on the Ethereum, the new Ethereum Classic after the fork, it's gonna be basically rendered useless, right? Uh, and if any of the exchanges actually support the old POW chain, that means that 
the USD locked on the chain is going to double. Sounds very, very sketch to me. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below regarding this. Will the different exchanges allow USDC and USDT as well as will OpenSea, will there be an OpenSea fork for the old proof of, uh, proof of work Ethereum? And another thing to note is a lot of these OG NFTs such as, you know, CryptoKitties and CryptoPunks, they're actually the OG network is Ethereum uh, POW, right? So isn't that where the original NFTs should maintain their value? I'm not sure, honestly. I'm pretty up in the air about this. The merge is only the first step in the roadmap for Ethereum scalability. So let's go ahead and take a look and hear what Vitalik has to say about the rest of the roadmap for Ethereum's scalability. Now, the merge is um, only the first step in this you know, fairly long and complicated roadmap that we have, right? Uh, so. After the merge, uh, there is a bunch of other things that we yeah, plan on focusing on, but probably the biggest focus uh, immediately after the merge is going to come on uh, scalability, right? So scalability is also a problem that we've been talking about, we've been complaining about, we've been thinking about how to fix pretty much since the beginning of the yeah, Ethereum project and uh, even before the chain launched them all those years ago. Um, and it's uh, something where we've been actively thinking about it. There have been a lot of groups that have been actively developing solutions. And there's a lot that has happened over the last couple of years in the layer two space in particular, right? So some of the roll-up projects, so projects like Optimism, Arbitrum, Z, uh, you know, ZK Sync, Loopring, Scroll, StarkNet, I mean, this big long list of uh, things is uh, exists now. Um, and it's, uh, that's something that did not exist at all, um, you know, t three years ago. And it's just made a huge amount of progress over even the last year, right? But there's even more work on uh, scalability left to go. Uh, so people who have been following the uh, Ethereum core development process might have heard of proto dank sharding. Um, so this is this uh, one of the next big EIPs that is um, in the process of development and is coming to Ethereum after the merge. Wow. Proto dank sharding, what an interesting word. So does that mean that Ethereum will have sharding capabilities soon? Is that actually fix the Ethereum scalability problem? Not really. Let's go ahead and take a look at the proto dank sharding website and see what exactly proto dank sharding is. So taking a look at the sort of notes ethereum.org, and this is the first step towards scalability after the merge. Just remember there are more steps we'll be covering. So the difference between the original sharding proposal, which was EIP 448 and proto dank sharding is that the EIP 448 attempts to minimize the changes needed today, whereas proto dank sharding makes a larger number of changes today so that fewer changes are required in the future upgrade to full sharding. So so this lets us know that protodank sharding is not full sharding. They have the sharding word in there, but it's not actual full sharding. And there are actually more steps required for Ethereum to actually get to full sharding. Go ahead and scroll down a bit more. You can see both EIP 448 and protodank sharding leads to a long run maximum usage of one megabyte per slot at 12 seconds. This works out to be about 2.5 terabytes a year, which is by far higher growth rate than Ethereum requires today. So it's gonna require the nodes running the Ethereum nodes to store even more data for the Ethereum blockchain, meaning that you're gonna have to have terabytes and terabytes of data and of uh, storage in order to run an Ethereum node. So full sharding, full sharding, which would be like the next 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 step for Ethereum, would add about 40 terabytes of historical blob data a year. That's, that's pretty crazy. The purpose of Ethereum consensus protocol is not to guarantee storage of all historical data forever. Rather, the purpose is to provide a highly secure real-time bulletin board and leave room for other decentralized protocols to do long-term storage. So they're actually planning to go ahead and have long-term storage done by other protocols and they haven't they didn't really talk about this in any of the videos today but we'll go ahead and cover that in a future video let's take a look and see what vitalik says about proto dank sharding uh, so basically the goal of proto dank sharding is to create what we call these uh, data transactions that have these data blobs and the point of this is to just increase the capacity of the Ethereum chain to hold a much larger amount of data. So Vitalik basically proved the point I was making earlier reading the Protodank sharding article. The blockchain node size for Ethereum will get huge after Protodank sharding is implemented. And there is this very nice synergy between these data blobs and a layer two rollup projects uh, because rollups uh, can are very good at scaling transactions, but they need some space to put their data. And expanding the blockchain's ability to hold more data so that these uh, layer two rollup projects can use is exactly um, what uh, proto-dank sharding is about, right? 
Now, proto tank sharding, as you can tell from the name, it's only the first step, right? So after proto tank sharding, there's going to be a, a second step, which is just called tank sharding. And tank sharding will massively increase the yeah, number of these uh, data blobs that the chain can hold. So the point of having larger blob sizes is so that layer two solutions like Optimism can go ahead and send their data and store more larger chunks of data on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, on the other side, the next step for the Optimism and the Layer 2 solutions is to implement some sort of roll-up system so that way they can compress the data that's being sent back to the Ethereum blockchain. Let's go and see the other side of scalability and see what's being implemented for the Layer 2 solutions. There is this very nice synergy between these data blobs and the Layer 2 roll-up projects uh, because roll-ups uh, can are very good at scaling transactions, but they need some space to put their data. Expanding the blockchain's ability to hold more data so that these uh, layer two rollup projects can use is exactly um, what uh, proto tank sharding is about, right? Now, proto tank sharding, as you can tell from the name, it's only the first step, right? So after proto tank sharding, there's going to be a, a second step, which is just called tank sharding. And tank sharding will massively increase the yeah, number of these uh, data blobs that the chain can hold. So like I said, basically there are two different sides to this coin. The side where you go ahead and increase blob size on the Ethereum blockchain, and this is done through the proto bank dank sharding. And then on the other side, you have the ZK rollups and other rollup mechanisms. So you can actually compress the data that's being sent to the main blockchain from the layer two solutions. What do you guys think about the layer two solutions? Do you think that this kind of proto dank sharding matched with the rollup system? Do you think that's a good combination? Or do you think there is a better, more efficient method of going ahead and storing blockchain data? The ETH merge is a huge step forward for Ethereum. However, it is just starting on its roadmap to scalability. It's very, very exciting times ahead. Please let me know if you guys are more excited for the merge or more excited for the scalability roadmap that's coming later regarding proto dank sharding, as well as ZK rollups and other rollup mechanisms. Very exciting guys. Anyways, thank you for viewing. I hope that helped you guys out. Have a great day. Peace out everyone.